The Y Curve with Phil Dobby and Roger Hearing. Britain is in an election year with grave concerns about the economy, public services and jobs. But what's the dominant factor in the latest by-election? The Gaza War. The horrific scenes from the conflict 2,000 miles away have cast a shadow over UK politics. Keir Starmer is facing revolts from his backbenchers over support for Israel. Rishi Sunak makes a rare speech outside Downing Street to call for public order and protection for MPs. Accusations of anti-Semitism and Islamophobia dominate the airwaves. So how did a war in which the UK has little involvement or influence come to create a political crisis here? The why? Curve. So we're in a situation now where what has the main thing really that's happening in British politics mm. is to do with something that we we don't have any control over. At well, all. It, yeah, for the agenda that's being driven by the politicians. Yeah. But I think for for most people, you know, the real issues are uh, cost of living, the the rising prices. It's not what they're out demonstrating in the streets about, is well, it? Well, yeah, that's the, the thing. Mm, it's yeah. all these massive rallies you see are nothing to do with any of that. Yeah, it's to do with with uh, Islamophobia. It's to do with anti-Semitism. It's to do with Gaza, it's to do with Israel. Yeah. And, well, and it's Palestine. not, though, is it? I mean, the actual, the protests aren't against Islamophobia or uh, against, um, you know, against any political, particular religion. By and large, those protests are people saying, hang on a second, there's 30,000 people getting killed in Gaza. We can't let that go. And, but but uh, there are protests against anti Semitism. There are people who are gathering yeah. together and saying, we are suffering anti Jews, suffering anti Semitism, yeah. and we need to protest about that. So it, it's going backwards and forwards. But, but the point is, really why is it that this has grabbed us so hard mm. and it's you know huge embarrassment to Keir Starmer you know he couldn't decide how to phrase the resolution what an immediate ceasefire a humanitarian pause yeah uh, you know and fighting because, with the I mean, SNP because everyone over feels as words. though they're treading on eggshells over all of this don't yeah. they yeah. And, I, and I wonder uh, because you've, you, you obviously don't want to be declared anti-semitic mm. uh, and there's the question mark about what what is anti-semitic actually so well, if you yeah. are against Israel are you anti-Semitic. If you if you're quite happy for Israel to exist, but you think Netanyahu is the wrong man to be running the country, is that? Yeah, or you're I mean, just against what they're doing in Gaza. I mean, yeah. there's loads of reasons. Mm. But at the same time, you've also got people saying, well, hang on, if you go and protest about what's going on in Gaza, by implication, you're supporting Hamas, which is considered mm. by the UK government to be a terrorist group and all the rest of it. Yeah. So but that's it, quite a big jump, though, isn't it? Well, to actually say that you're supporting Hamas. So a, lot saying, of, a lot of people say that. A lot you, of the op- opponents say it. Yeah. But I mean, if you are if, you, if you're against the killing, uh, you, it, it doesn't mean that you are, you know, that you're you're supporting uh, Hamas, which is obviously an awful organisation and how can you support them? So this is a big jump to say that, you know, Israel is allowed to march in to this territory, yeah. kill so many people uh, and, and, to fight Hamas with so much collateral damage. Well, but then, you know, they projected, the slogan they projected onto Big Ben was from the river to the sea, yeah. which is one Who's of the... Well, someone did that. Someone yeah. did that, but yeah. someone involved in all this. And you yeah. hear that chant at these, yeah. these demonstrations. And that is, by definition, a way of saying there should be no Israel. So yeah. I mean, that, that's all it means. But that is, but, it, but someone did that. You know, you know not yeah. the majority of the population. So no, some no. extremists, you could say, did that. But, and, and this is obviously getting some extremists who are doing extreme things. I mean, not hugely extreme things. Things. I mean, they are saying things which are offending people. Yes, there's not slaughter and killings happening in this country, thank goodness. And you know, so yeah, we have and, to be thankful for that. And we also don't have much influence or power in what's going on. The US perhaps has some influence on Israel, mm. but you know, all this fight about what we should say in Parliament, a statement or whatever it is, makes absolutely no difference to what actually happens on the ground in yeah. in Gaza. So it's a really bizarre situation but where our is, politics but, is dictated. But, in this, this way. but maybe it's because I mean, there's you know the, the the question raised very often. You know, well, why are you not protesting against Hamas? To which the answer is, well, you know, they are a terrorist organisation. There's no point in you know. Mm. Let's take it as read that nobody supports Hamas. I mean, some do, but by and large, the, the majority of the population don't. So there's a bit of a wasted protest. The reason I think people are protesting is because they want the situation to change and they feel as though they've got some political leverage. So if they can leverage our government to change its stance, then that may, may change Israel's attitude as well, if Israel feels as though it's not got international support. Because otherwise you'd be saying, well, we should be uh, protesting against Russia, for well, example. Yes. And, and there have been protests. But we, are not, but, but, but we don't but, have involvement. 
no, and we don't have involvement, but well, we do, of course. Uh, you know, in that we are helping. Well, we're supplying weapons. Yeah, yes. uh, but you know, you can't say, well, okay, we, we want Russia to stop, uh, and because our government isn't supporting Russia, no, no, no. so it's not a direct parallel. Well, there isn't no, but but I suppose the whole point is that why is something that's happening so far away from us and so mm. much virtually out of our control? affecting some of the major political decisions at the moment. I mean, Rishi Sunak going out in front of Downing Street and saying, we've got to protect MPs, MPs are under threat, we've got to have order, we've got to restrict protests. Yeah. Um, and this is, this, is the, this is what he chooses to make a, a really powerful statement on, not about schools, hospitals, how much people are earning, the state yeah. of the economy, none of that. Well, that was just a reaction to uh, George Galloway, wasn't it? Well, he Galloway is a very interesting character in himself. And and I'm sure we'll touch on that as well in the, in the next half hour. But, I mean, yeah. isn't, isn't the answer to all of these questions the fact that there are you know, close to four million Muslims living in this country and they will feel that this is an attack on, yeah. on, on them? Yeah. And, you know, and, and they feel... As there are also a large, is a very large Jewish community who clearly do... <laughs> Also feel that they are under threat as well yeah. right now. But anyway, small, it's like three hundred thousand though. It, you know, so it's much 000. smaller. It's smaller, um, but you know, but obviously not to be ignored. And they've got a they've got a case too. And and you know, and also people imagine. So they're finding it hard because mm. there's a war. And in fact, you know, well, maybe we should lead in with this when we talk to to our guest today. Mm. But that they're feeling the pressure because they are coming under attack. You know, a lot of verbal attack or written attacks because of what they're. Prime Minister, or the you know the country's Prime Minister is. If they are Israelis, if they if they're Israelis, well, they're Jews. They're not necessarily Israelis. Well, yeah, that's so that's there's true whole sorts too. of distinctions. Uh, but but Let's, I mean, similarly, you know, what about Russians? You know, who are living in this country as well, who have been subject mm-hmm. to attacks uh, because of what Mr. Putin's done. You know, no it's control all of this. Things happening far away that have a big effect on our politics. Let's talk about this with Robert Ford, who's professor of political science at Manchester University, and joins us now. So, Rob, does it strike you as strange that our, our Prime Minister has picked on this issue as? Uh, something that's worth stepping outside number ten to talk about is this is this the overriding issue that, uh, that, that that Britain is facing? I mean, for most people, we'll probably say, well, actually, no, the economy seems a little bit more important to us at the moment. I mean, it clearly isn't the overriding issue for the vast majority of voters. If we go and look at most of the polling right now, the top three issues have been the same for most of the past year, two years, even the economy the cost of living, the NHS, public services more generally. So this isn't even in the top five. And for, in many polls, it wouldn't even be in the top 10. So why is Rishi talking about this rather than all those things that people think are more important? Well, because on all those things that people think are more important, he's extremely unpopular and his ideas aren't really going down very well with voters. Whereas here is an issue where he feels... Uh, he is on the same side as the electorate and can hopefully um, open up some divisions in his opponents. So it's the classic move that all political leaders try to, um, to to make, which is to make the political argument as far as possible about things that unite your side and divide the other side. No, but but he's, not, he's not got the support of the people of Rochdale, obviously, where George Galloway romped home over, well, I'm sure he does care about the people of Rochdale, but by and large, it was uh, he was there on... On one single agenda, wasn't he? And he got the vast majority of the vote. Yes, and, and he did for both the Tories and Labour. Well, that's true. Uh, but, but there's there's a few things that we need to sort of um, bear in mind with regards to the whole uh, Rochdale result. I mean, the, the, the first is it's a by-election in a general election year. Um, everyone participating in that by-election knows that what they're doing is not electing a government or not even electing an MP for several years. You're electing an MP for less than a year. Uh, Secondly, there was no official Labour candidate because the Labour candidate was mired in scandal, but they couldn't remove him uh, from the ballot paper. And thirdly, George Galloway himself is a bit of a one-off. I mean, he's the first guy since Winston Churchill to get elected for four different seats. That's not because he's in the same bracket as Winston Churchill uh, as a politician. Um, But what he does have is a kind of unique appeal, a unique protest appeal in a very particular kind of seat. All three of the seats he's won since Labour chucked him out 20 years ago have been seats with large Muslim communities where people are very angry uh, about um, Britain's foreign policy or Labour's foreign policy or both. Uh, Bethnal Green and Bow, Bradford West, and now Rochdale. Mm. And it, it it seems odd, though. It, you know what you say is right, but for example, the reason the Labour candidate was disowned by Labour was to do with anti-Semitism, which was in regard to Gaza. Why is it, Rob, that this 
situation that has been going on for many months now, obviously horrible, seeing the every night on the television, the terrible things, suffering that's going on there. Why is this conflict having such a, a big impact influence on British politics, whether within the Labour Party, the Tory party or elsewhere? Well, I think the short answer is because it's a thing that people who really care a lot about politics care a lot about. It's one of those issues that doesn't necessarily drive a wedge so much between the traditional supporters of Labour and the Conservatives as drive a wedge between the activists and everybody else. Uh, I mean, we've all seen um, week after week now for many months the marches that are taking place over the Gaza conflict. And, you know, there are there are lots of people on those marches, but this is a big country of 70 million people. 100,000 people on a march is not a very large portion of the electorate, and most of these marches aren't that big. So what you have is a situation where you've got a, a sort of small minority of people with very, very intense preferences who are entirely focused on this issue. And it's very likely, I think, that things like social media have added to that because they're all consuming and sharing, you know, pretty horrific stories about what's going on both in that conflict and what's going on back here in Britain in the arguments about that conflict. But for the vast majority of voters, for the people who think about politics for a, a minute or two a day, the voters who decide the elections, this issue is just not on their agenda at all. Um, they're not thinking about it. They're not talking about it. Uh, and it's not going to decide their votes in the general election. But who is it that turns up to MPs meetings? Who is it that emails them? Who is it that messages them on social media? It's that first group, the very, very highly engaged group, the very activist group. So MPs are hearing a lot about it as well. Uh, and as a result, they end up arguing with each other about it as well. So it's... It's like we've got two parallel worlds, the world of the people who think about politics all the time, who are consumed by this, and the world of the people who don't care about politics at all, the normal everyday Joes who aren't thinking about this at all. So are our streets being hijacked? Are those protests, those 100,000 people, are they hijacking our streets? Are they hostile to our values? Do they have no respect for our democratic traditions? Because I presume it's those protests that Rishi Sunak was talking about, and that is directly uh, a quote from what he said. The speech. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm not keen on that language. I think it's a little bit ironic to be giving a speech about the importance of not being divisive and polarising and then using divisive and polarising language right in the middle of yeah. it. Um, I, I would say... People have, you know, people have very sincerely held feelings about this issue on, on both sides of it. I mean, we, we are in a multicultural society where a lot of people, you know, are directly or indirectly exposed to the consequences of this conflict. Hamza Youssef, for example, has talked very movingly about this. Jewish MPs with Israeli relatives have as well. Um, a lot of people want to express their strong feelings about this conflict, and they have every right to do so in a free society. But, you know, as I was mentioning, there's, there's, there's the division between, you know, the, the activist minority and the average voter. But within these protests, there's also the division between the average protester and the extreme activist minority of protesters. And again, here I think we see the problem of reporting and of social media, uh, which is if you've got a small group of loudmouth gobshites, if I can uh, give them a technical name, um, using offensive language, they will get a disproportionate amount of attention for that. Um, now, with people like that, I think the language of hijack probably is appropriate, but in the sense of they are hijacking what is generally a broader and more peaceful and more civil protest in order to be angry and divisive. And all of us who give them lots of attention and get annoyed with them are kind of doing their job for them because that then becomes the way in which the protest gets seen. But anyone who's, you know, I mean, I, I live in Manchester. I've seen these things come through town. You guys will probably have done if you're in London as well. Most of the people on it are not like that at all. Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, do I think protest organisers may need to do more to police internally these protests to try and keep those people out well yeah in theory i do although it's not an easy thing to do um so i, I do feel for them yeah. in that regard yeah. 
and, 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 and protests are almost always like that. You have extremes within whatever happens. But, but I suppose the other thing, Rob, is what you're saying is that, in a way, the attention that this is getting from Richie Sunak, but also from Keir Starmer, who seems to have been tearing himself into small pieces to try and get the exact wording on a resolution, that actually they don't need to be doing that, that that is a distortion, because most people aren't that exercised about Right, because they're answering their own parties rather than the public, isn't it? So they're mm. trying to keep their party together because their party, in both cases, their parties are divided on this issue. Yes, that's that's exactly right. It's, it's not as if either Starmer or Sunak have an option to remain silent on this issue because of the problem of party management. I mean... It would be if it were being like brutally frank, which we can be because we're not politicians, we could say, well, the amount of difference it makes, what position Keir Starmer takes or even Rishi Sunak takes with regards um the conflict in, in Gaza is is the square root of nothing, really, because it's not going to affect the behavior of Hamas. It's not going to affect the behavior of the Netanyahu government. It's not as if the Netanyahu Netanyahu government, if they were to receive a very strongly worded email from Keir Starmer will hold their hands up and go, oh, actually, it's a fair cop, Gov, we'll stop now. Um, this is not going to happen. So all of this is really symbolic politics, but it's nonetheless important, despite being symbolic politics, because the Jewish community in Britain care very much what position both Labour and the Conservatives take on this. The Muslim communities of Britain care very much what position uh, everybody takes on this. This is the politics of symbols and narratives. It's not the politics of substance. Yeah. Nothing is going to be changed by these outcomes. That doesn't mean they don't matter. So I can't imagine Keir Starmer writing a, a, a sharply worded email about anything at all, to be quite well, honest yeah. with you. But I mean, if, if, if it is a case of just satisfying the, the population who feel passionately about this, then it's, it's curious, isn't it? Because if you just look at the sheer numbers, you'd be saying, well, OK, uh, there's, a, there's a lot more, a much bigger Muslim population than there is a, a Jewish population in the UK. If we're going to take a side on this, and it seems like we have to, uh, you'd be you'd be taking the side of the uh, the uh, you know you'd, you'd be supporting uh, the the action. Well, not Hamas necessarily, you, you'd be but more, you'd, yes, you'd be yeah. more pro one side of the argument than the other, purely yeah. in in terms of numbers. But I suppose, Rob, the point is, it's not that, is it? It's to do with the way. Britain is now the number of, of of these people within society, but how we perceive what's going on in Gaza. But but why is it a huge election issue? Is it going to be a huge election issue in the general election? Is it is it possible it's going to be a major thing? It doesn't seem very likely. No, in short, I really don't think it will be um, for two reasons. Firstly, as as I mentioned before, if we look at all the polling on what issues are most important to voters in general, it's it's not really on the list at all. We actually have two polls of Muslim voters specifically taken since this conflict began, and in both cases, uh, the conflict is. Is, is the fourth most important issue. Now, that's higher than it is yeah. with the public as a whole, but it's way behind the NHS, the cost of living and the economy, the kitchen table issues. Um, so there's no reason to think that all of those voters saying that are lying to pollsters and actually secretly they really care about uh, the Gaza conflict and that's how they're going to cast their vote. So that's reason number one. But reason number two as you mentioned, the, the Jewish community is not really big enough to be decisive in, in any but two seats, I think, in the whole country. Uh, and even then, you have to make some pretty generous assumptions to say they'll be decisive. The Muslim community is bigger, but it concentrates in seats where there are absolutely colossal Labour majorities. And I've tried crunching the numbers on this. And, you know, you can bend over backwards to be generous to Galloway type independence or Galloway aligned candidates and say, well, what if they got 50% of the Muslim vote? What if they got 50% of the Muslim vote? Nothing, nothing. What if th th there is no consequence? Labour will still win all of those seats uh, because even if they have a lower than average swing to them in those seats, because these are seats where they have a massive majority amongst non-Muslim voters as well. And, you know, why would they get a below average swing amongst non-Muslim voters in those seats? You know, if you've got a, a, an election campaign where Labour have a 20 point lead in the polls and you're talking about seats where they won with massive majorities at a time when they were getting an absolute thumping in 2019, you know, 
there's an awful lot of claims being made about how, oh, yeah, Labour really needs to worry, West Street needs to worry, Rishnara Ali needs to worry. No, they don't. So is it then perhaps, Rob, really something to do with a sort of internal psychodrama in Labour? Because obviously it's not that long ago when anti-Semitism was, uh, again, a massive issue. No, in, very in touchy the about period. it, obviously. Yeah. yeah. Is, it, is that what's going on in a way, that the, the, the Keir Starmer just knows that is toxic and he needs to address it? I think that is a big part of what is going on here, is that really this is about um, factional divides, but also symbolic divides and identity divides within um, the Labour Party. I think there are a lot of um, Muslim uh, voters in Labour who do genuinely feel that Labour doesn't um, represent them as well as they could. Um, there is a long-standing issue, I think, with um, Muslim communities feeling that Labour kind of put them on the margins a little bit like this. And so then this becomes like a, uh, a, 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 this issue becomes a vehicle for expressing that more general discontent. That's something that you see Galloway being very effective at exploiting, for example. But there's also, we know, uh, a second issue here, which is the Jewish community was deeply upset with Labour under uh, Corbyn because because of the endless, uh, seemingly, uh, anti-Semitism scandals that occurred during that period. And where those two uh, issues come together is that we do know that a section of the radical left, the hard left, so to speak, that is where a lot of the anti-Semitism accusations has, have come from. And that tends to be a group that is extremely noisy and vocal in its support for the Palestinian cause as well. So. On both sides, what you might call the Labour left and the Labour right, a lot of these accusations being thrown backwards and forwards are as much about factional politics as they are about the conflict um, uh, out in the Middle East. They're as much about the conflict between Keir Starmer and Jeremy Corbyn as the conflict between uh, Hamas uh, and Benjamin Netanyahu. So th there's a lot more going on there than just this conflict. So let's take the Jewish factor out of all of this for the moment. We can put it back in again in a second. But just imagine there's a part of the world where tens of thousands of people are getting killed and people feel as though uh, that is not right, even though it is a response to a circumstance that they also believe is, is, is not right and is horrific. And so they want to go and protest in that because they want to have, they feel like they want to have some influence on that. Uh, and they feel like if they can have influence, politicians might write that strongly worded email uh, that might have some impact. And, you know, we're already seeing in the United States, for example, you know, the uh, the vice president is over there at the moment mm -hmm. trying to negotiate a, a peace deal. So the tide has turned more in America than it has in, in, in this country, it's fair to say, even though they don't have uh, as big a, a Muslim population. So... It's not really necessarily a, a, a Jewish anti-Jewish thing, is it? It's really just a here's something that we feel like uh, we can have some influence over. So if that is the factor, if that is what most people are on those marches are believing, to have the prime minister saying, well, actually, no, that, you know, what you're fighting for there is hostile to our views and uh, our values and you've got no respect for our democratic traditions – it seems a, a curious stance to take because for most people, this is they, they just want to do good. Well, I, I agree. And th this is why I, I feel that the speech kind of contradicted its own premise, because I think it's one thing to say that, you know, we don't want people going on these marches uh, promoting hate. And I think that that's that's a completely justifiable stance. But to frame the marches themselves as being primarily about that, I think is really very unfair on the people going on these marches. Most of those people are either pursuing, you know, a political goal in a legitimate political way, or simply very, very upset and distressed about this issue and looking for a collective way to express that upset and, and distress. And both of those are completely legitimate things to do. It's also not very long ago that we had this exact argument um, uh, in the run up to uh, the Remembrance Sunday uh, ceremonies. And we had Suella Braverman, who was n not one of politics is great diplomats um, making claims about how uh, what she seemed to regard as illegitimate forces in the public were going to hijack the Remembrance Day 
um, ceremonies. And that proved to be an accurate forecast, but not in the way she expected, because it wasn't the marches uh, angry about Gaza who hijacked the Remembrance Sunday. It was a bunch of tanked up, unpleasant, far-right thugs who attempted to storm the Senate. The EDL, I think, wasn't it? It stirred up by what the Home Secretary had said. Mm, yeah. It's a- so they say, what we're saying is the government is actually spreading more division uh, than, than curing But, but maybe that is in itself interesting, Rob, because within the Tory party, I mean, you mentioned how Rishi Sunak perhaps was trying to address particular audiences within his, his area, but there's been a lot of accusations of Islamophobia within the Tory party. And they continue to be there, and it goes back a very long way. Uh, is is that a real problem? In fact, that that this is perhaps channeling something which appeals to certain audiences that maybe the Tories wouldn't want to confront, but exi- actually are there where there is strong Islamophobia. Well, I, I think Saeed Avasi put this very well. She said that the Conservatives were absolutely unstinting in their attacks on. Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party for tolerating uh, anti-Semitism, for indulging anti-Semitism, for failing to call out anti-Semitism by name. And she said, if those are the standards we set, we have to live by them, and we aren't. And what happened a few weeks ago when Rishi Sunak expelled Lee Anderson was, I think, uh, very revealing. He withdrew the whip. He said, what Lee Anderson said is unacceptable. But then he wouldn't say what it was that he'd said that was unacceptable or what the nature of it was that was unacceptable. And clearly he'd briefed all of his ministers to do the same thing because there was this series of ludicrous, surreal interviews where you had ministers of our government saying, we have removed the whip from this man. He is, what he said is unacceptable. Why is it unacceptable? What he said is unacceptable, but why is it unacceptable? It's unacceptable. Why? You know, if you can't, explain what is unacceptable about somebody's sentiment well you just look ludicrous you, and, mm. and it, why why do you think that is that they, i that noticed they just... that rishi sunak time and time again uses this line it's the right thing to do it's as though uh, you know don't question me what i'm saying is right uh, and uh, so, so everything else is wrong so it's it, so is this all part of a deliberate ploy to say well okay don't think about this issue too much um we're just right on it. I, I think actually there is an analogy to what happened uh, in the Corbyn years because Corbyn was repeatedly and uh, I think perceptively attacked for refusing to condemn anti-Semitism in isolation. He always used the phrasing and all other forms of racism. And the reason seemed to be because he didn't want to accept a framing of the issue in which this was a particular problem. Similarly, it seems Sunak is just unwilling to say what it was Lee Anderson did uh, that was wrong because he doesn't want to place the spotlight on a particular problem, namely hatred of Muslims or Islamophobia. And in both cases, the reason is, I think there are people who are important to my party who I don't want on the wrong side, you know, I don't want to be putting on the wrong side of a red line over this. Um, And that's a huge problem because the whole point of withdrawing the whip from someone like Lee Anderson is that you're supposed to be drawing a clear line and then you're immediately blurring it. It's a big problem. So this has been going on forever, obviously, hasn't it? And the attitude towards uh, Palestine and Israel is as old as the hills almost. Well, Uh, since 1948. Well, you know, that's as old as the hills as far as I'm concerned. The... um, and yet there's you know a lot of other uh, issues that we've faced a lot of other examples of discrimination so if i mean there's cases against uh, russian workers you know russian people who've got nothing to do with the activities of putin uh, who are under attack within this country now just because they happen to be russian before brexit polish workers were were getting, were getting abused for taking our jobs you know you could find you know t- take any piece of current affairs over the last however many decades there's always Repercussions. There's always groups that are going to feel uh, victimised by it all, but we don't seem to state their case quite as much as we do when it comes to uh, anything to do with Israel and Palestine, for whatever reason. Yeah, it has a much, much stronger pull on us somehow, Rob, doesn't it? Yeah, and I, I do find that, I must admit, puzzling. Um, I mean, what what is it about this conflict that is so so symbolically powerful for so many people in different parts of the political argument. And I, I mean, I must admit, I honestly don't have a good answer on, on why well, that Jew- is. I'm sure Jewish people would say it's because there is a, sl- a slab of the population that uh, are anti-Semitic and this is an opportunity for them to show their true colours. 
And, you know, we, we, we don't get quite as riled by all those other examples I gave because it's not a Jewish issue. Well, I mean, certainly, for example, you know, the, the enormous prominence that the Palestine conflict has always had on the radical left is really hard to explain unless it's it's hard to explain in terms of the magnitude of the conflict versus any other conflict, however you want to define it, unless you are thinking that they are in some way um, uh, singling out Israel as, as uniquely um, bad uh, as an aggressor uh, in in this conflict, as uh, or indeed uniquely aggressive and so on. So there certainly does, and this was of course what an awful lot of the arguments over anti-Semitism uh, were about, is when when does the line get crossed? A why 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 is Israel held uh, to this this seemingly higher standard? Why are conflicts involving it seemingly given more prominence? And B at what point does criticism of of Israel as a democracy that we want to be holding to certain standards in terms of its behaviour creep over into criticism of it as a Jewish state and then into criticism of Jews. And, you know, we, we see this over and over again. So, you know, there's been a big argument with regards to these marches uh, about the, the chant from the river to the sea. Um, I, I was briefly embroiled in this on Twitter because I, I foolishly said that I think, well, that's not, if you're looking to persuade people, that's possibly not the best way to do it. And then an awful lot of people got very angry in my replies and said, how dare you criticize this chant? It's perfectly legitimate. It's just an expression of a desire for unity uh, uh, of all the peoples that live in Palestine. I think, well, you know, maybe a few people are, are thinking it that way. That I'm would be a very twisted or... interpretation, I think. <laughs> yeah, I mean, when you look at some of the people people who are chanting it, they don't look like people who are eagerly calling for unity between, um, you know, all the peoples of the Middle East. They're not there for a nuanced debate, that's what you're no, saying. I mean, mm. clearly, a lot of people use that chant to mean Palestinians should have this land and the Jews should be out of it. Mm. And the, the fact that uh, that is, A, abundantly clearly true for a lot of the people using the chant it's clearly how it's received by jewish people and nobody using this chant or defending it seems to care a jot about the first two things i mean it is problematic isn't it mm, it, it is you know, and, it, and it's a weird thing i mean it's what you were i was thinking when you were saying about how labor has this massive problem but anti-semitism historically of course has much been, more been a feature of the right it was a certain point, I mean, up until the 60s, when it was a standard thing that the Labour Party was very much in support of Israel. These things seem to have changed quite dramatically in the last 30 to 40 years. Well, I think uh, there's a couple of things I think are interesting about about this. I mean, the, the, the first is, if you look at the survey evidence on this, uh, anti-Semitism is still, on balance, more common amongst people who consider themselves on the right. Um, but you get it amongst supporters of all parties. What it's, what it's closely attached to, though, uh, is thinking like authoritarianism, conspiratorial thinking, deep political disaffection, and so on. And the reason is because I think anti-Semitism is unusual as a form of uh, prejudice, if you will, because it's it's got a narrative associated uh, with it, which is to do with uh, con conspiratorial elites, shadowy forces controlling the world, and so on. And that kind of argument finds a very receptive audience on what you might call the hard right, the far right, the radical right, but it also finds a very receptive audience on the hard left, the far left, because right. both of those groups of people tend to be people who say, we don't get to have the good things in life because there are powerful forces that stop us. You know, why doesn't Jeremy Corbyn win? Because powerful forces are stopping him from winning. Why don't we get socialism? Because powerful forces are conspiring to stop it. Why Why do we uh, not have uh, a powerful and resurgent nation? Because powerful globalist forces are stopping it. So it's a unique form of prejudice in that it combines prejudice against a group with assigning that group a kind of central role in a sort of conspiratorial narrative. So do you think that's the case, that there are people who are thinking, yes, that the, the Jewish population or parts of the, the Jewish establishment are behind all of this? I mean, that seemed, I know that might have been the thinking perhaps 20 or 30 years ago, but do you think that's, that's still a belief held by some people? Obviously not the vast majority. I think there's no doubt of it. 
Uh, I think it's an argument, like I say, that you see very regularly getting made uh, on the far left and on the far right, that there's a shadowy network of groups controlling um, uh, things from behind the scenes, very well resourced, and Jewish uh, people are part of that shadowy network. I think that's the thing so the, so the support for, So the support for that argument would be, well, OK, here we've got a situation where America keeps on providing support uh, to Israel, and Israel is killing a lot of people with it, and that would be a reason to protest. But you know, the counter argument to that is that America's starting to question all of that, aren't they? And, you know, more as I said earlier, more than us, they're starting mm. to say, "Well, we've got to lean on the." Uh, well, the because Israeli they actually authorities. have more influence than we do. Yeah, it, ma- it matters. Well, yeah, I mean, I think uh, the American situation. I mean, it's it's interesting because obviously, like the Jewish population in America is a lot bigger, uh, and they they are you know, a, a very politically well-organized group within American politics. So the, the support for Israel, it's geostrategic. It's also about domestic politics to some extent, but it has never been unconditional. Uh, and clearly what has been going on uh, in the recent conflicts is it's reaching the point where American leaders are saying, well, this this is just... It, it, it is dangerous and destabilizing and just wrong. You're taking this too far. You need to back off. Um, not much evidence yet. <laughs> not having much, much effect so far. Yeah. yeah. So um, do, you, do, do you think as we as we approach the next election then, so if, if, if both sides of politics just sort of ignored this issue, said, you know, I'll just all calm down, people, you know, less protesting in the street. We've heard what you had to say. Uh, no need to say it anymore. Uh, let's just see how it all sorts itself out. Do you think that, you know, nearly four million Muslims living in this country would say, because I'm sure, you know, they've got attachment to, it's their people. They'd see it as their people being attacked. Uh, do you think they'd just let it wash over and say, well, that's fair enough, actually. Yeah, OK, we've we've had our say. Uh, let's no, move let's on. let's concentrate on, what, on schools and hospitals and, and all the rest yeah. of it. Is, is it really going to disappear as an issue before the next election? I guess if they've got no choice, because both sides of politics have taken the same stance, uh, they can either you know accept that or move to Rochdale and uh, and live there instead. Well, I, d- I don't think most voters live in the world of stark binaries that people like George Galloway inhabit. I think the average voter in Rochdale, if, if and I'm sure Labour will campaign very hard in Rochdale come the general election because they don't like losing seats to George Galloway. Um, uh, If Labour are campaigning in Rochdale and they say, look, obviously it's a horrible mess in Gaza and we're going to do our best to sort that out. But uh, in in the short run, what do you care about? You care about the bills you've got to pay. You care about the state of the local hospital. You care about the state of the local schools. And if you elect a Labour MP, you're going to get much better solutions on that. Elect a Labour government, you're going to get much better solutions on that than than you're going to get by electing George Galloway or, or electing the Conservatives. And I think the average Muslim voter would turn around and say, as indeed someone did in a focus group, I won't, they, they use rather more uh, purple language than I'm going to use now, but they basically said, look, world peace is a great thing, and peace in the Middle East is a really important goal but uh, I find it hard to make that my number one priority when the town I live in is a dump yeah, or yeah, yeah. You know, they use a rather ruder word and, and, and you know and Labour can say we are prepared to commit as you've said to Keir Starmer writing a very strongly worded <laughs> <Will>. email uh, <laughs> to Netanyahu yes, 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 asking sure. him please desist or a you permanent know, ceasefire yeah, or yeah, whatever or something, it is. something yeah. like that yeah. so it sounds like what you're saying uh, you know as we wrap up is that really that, you know our our country is not at war with itself. You know that there's not. We're not being pulled apart by this issue. Are you saying that it's actually being ramped up a little bit by politicians for their own gain? Because that's maybe that's not what you intended. But a few things you've said today has had me thinking that's that's actually what's happening. Well, I think some politicians are clearly ramping it up for their own gain. George Galloway clearly is. Um, yeah, some some yeah. of the people uh, on the Tory right who've pushed this issue clearly are because they feel it's a uh, a conversation that's more productive for them than a conversation about the NHS or the state of the economy. So they're trying to change the subject to this because it's more. Fa- favorable terrain they feel not necessarily that they think it's you know a slam dunk win for them but it's just it's less bad um but on the other hand i also think there are a lot of politicians and a lot of political activists who are engaged in arguments about this because they sincerely care about it very much and they can care about it very much in terms of the symbolism of it while admitting themselves and their voters admitting too we can't actually change it but we still care about expressing our values on this so i think it can be both things some people are exploiting it some people are being divisive some people are acting in bad faith but other people in the same arguments are 
just trying to express the really strongly held feelings of their voters about you know what is a really really ugly and messy conflict it is it is a nasty thing and but, whether or not we can do anything about it i suppose it's normal that people would feel that way but are we the world's most successful multi-ethnic multi-faith democracy uh, that is being deliberately undermined by forces that are trying to tear us apart that? I mean, it's extreme stuff, though, isn't it? it? Is, you know, as we were saying earlier, you know, why well, did he do that? We'll I see wonder. how it all plays into the election in one form or another. Rob, thank you very much for being with us and uh, giving us a sense of how it sort of is working and how the political system is responding to it. Thank Thanks, you. Rob. Cheers. Thank you. And next week, yes. Um, well, very local. Uh, yes. So here's Rishi Sunak, you know, trying to cut spending as much as possible mm. to try and give us a little bit of, you know, a little bit of a bribe to get him through to the next election. Which, of course, you know, he stands every chance of losing. Yes. Uh, but meanwhile, <laughs> meanwhile, meanwhile, the people who actually empty our bins, run our schools, yeah. run our social services, do the actual work, are running out of money. I'm talking about local government, local yeah. councils. We've had two or three going technically bankrupt to some phrase that they use to say that they are basically have basically run out of money mm. but they are responsible legally for certain services they have to keep going so yeah. right now a lot of them are slashing libraries any kind of arts funding anything like this because they have to keep the basic services going and some of them can barely do that so so is that because they're not getting uh, enough money or is it because uh, either from uh, ratepayers or from uh, from local council government? tax these council days. tax sorry yeah they yeah. are showing my age again uh, so uh, I went left the country they were called ratepayers <laughs> and then come back at this council tax yeah. how could I keep up yeah, the money you answer your question is yes the money yeah. isn't there and the support yeah. from central government isn't there and the whole system isn't working and that and yet we have a prime minister saying well you know they've just got to uh, you know get rid of all those useless jobs in stuff like diversity, and diversity. Monitors, yeah. well, they ain't, yeah. ain't going to work there isn't mm. enough in that but we're going to confront that next week we're going to get a sense of is local government broken yeah and how do we fix it we'll always look for the answer uh, we'll do that next week on the Y Curve thanks for listening bye the Y Curve <laughs>